Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, to Dr. Shah for giving me this opportunity uh, to share some of my thoughts on how we can cope up with many things that are happening in today's world in terms of technology, data analytics, and also the way people work, people move, and even goods and how things are shifting in a very significantly major way and how we can absorb all this into our uh, decision-making solution development in transportation. As you know, transportation is also very multidisciplinary. So without much further ado, uh, I just want to run down a, couple, a few slides. There are quite a few actually, but I'll be running them quite quickly. I'm not going to talk about each slide. I don't know whether you can see the slide, but I can just quickly run down that the way the 21st century demands of us is quite fast changing because the way goods and other uh, people movements are changing also in the way that they deem fit and for their convenience. Uh, so we also ask the question, so what is the people or uh, shippers want? They want an end-to-end trip-making ability, uh, and also a lot of travel choices. Their preferences are nowadays unlimited with the smartphone and such. They get everything on their hand tips. And uh, so we got to have information that is um, almost near real time, I would say. And we have all the technologies that are taking shape in the, on our infrastructure, roadway infrastructure. But then there's also a need for integrated approach. Even today, most of the uh, states uh, operate modally. There is no in, there is intermodal efforts to connect the modes, but I think they got to go much faster in every sense, from planning to operations and maintenance, not just one part. Maybe operations are trying their best to do that part, but so that takes a lot of a unified mission by the agency or organization and collaborative decision making. And this is just the, the, the side of organization because projects are delivered by jurisdictions and uh, it's time we change that approach to taking a system wide view, not a part of the view uh, and then solving it. So that way we are only addressing the problem which is localized and the pro solution can go drift to the upstream or downstream or some other part of the network or some other mode even. So we got to uh, kind of uh, capture those impacts. So what, are, what is that we are supposed to do in terms of uh, the 21st century transportation movement? I already said end-to-end -end trip making ability is no option here. Everybody expects a good quality of service, enhanced user experience and all that stuff. And we are in the process of building the connected transportation system through all the, uh, you know, technology deployments and advancements that are taking place. But then there is also another essential uh, kind of uh, attribute, scaling leadership. If leadership can slow down or accelerate, it can work both ways. And that's where some of the things I want to share today, I'm not showing you any equations. I told Dr. Shah, and we're not getting too technical either. Uh, but, you know, uh, because you guys are going to occupy in future the leadership role. So leadership is as important as a, a specialist uh, in moving things faster. So creating outcomes that matter most because that's what leaders do. And there's creative leadership versus proactive. I think we moved away from reactive to getting proactive. But now we got to get creative, which is, in other words, innovative. We can do the same thing much differently using today's tools and technologies. So that's where I think the focus should be. We should also be quick and agile so that we can deliver effective transportation systems. And lastly, of course, knowledge capital. Knowledge base is expanding so fast that you got to know how to manage knowledge. Uh, so there's the knowledge management tools uh, that go into organizational capacity and professional uh, capacity building. Uh, so the other thing is tracking technology. I think we are trying to do a good job on that. What is coming into play to improve our system performance, but we also should know its impacts. And so the trends are very important to meet user expectations. 
uh, and early adoption to advance innovation so that you learn what, what works well and what doesn't work well sometimes when you adopt new technologies. And that's through uh, advancing innovation. And then you go to fully scalable applications and user cases. But then there's the re-engineering and retooling. Agencies like I worked in two state DOTs, Florida DOT and Virginia DOT. Uh, there's a lot of legacy. We got to re-engineer and reprocess many things, both business and technical. As we get new data sets, we got to adopt those data sets so that they're data-driven solutions. And so some of us have advanced, uh, tried to advance some data business plans because it has to be linked to the outcomes and outputs. And there's a performance for agencies too, not just the network system they operate. So we're trying to do that. So accelerators are user preferences using data, today's data and its effectiveness in getting new insights and uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, understanding. And decision making is uh, also has to be accelerated. As I said, that's, that's one of the kind of slowdowns, I would say just like traffic, right? It slows down. Uh, so what are the drivers? So uh, you all know this, uh, we are getting towards an automated roadway system. Before ITS began, it was called Intelligent Vehicle Highway System. That was the term they coined, uh, but it just it turned into different names. But we have sensors everywhere now. We can direct, we can talk about uh, load stresses on bridges, bridge decks, uh, to sensors in fleets that go and maintain and operate, including transit. So there's so much of electronics and uh, other technologies at work, and so much data is generated, but then we got to know how to harness that power of the new data sets, and that's the goal uh, we got to look at. So we uh, try to do some, uh, I'll be kind of bringing in some examples as I speak. Uh, so these are the technologies that we're using in this past decade at least. A lot of them, and we are getting into uh, newer technologies as well that I didn't mention. Uh, but I also want to draw the focus always back to transportation because uh, we got to balance demand with supply. That's the major goal uh, because that's where the congestion begins or bottleneck surface. So uh, and real-time demand management is something that state DOTs have been, I mean, the US DOT has been advancing that concept through active traffic demand management framework. This is it. And so this tells the whole story. You might have seen this before, but there it offers a way to kind of develop tools, methodologies, and how to use that for different applications, be it pricing, dynamic information, that is uh, traveler information, multimodal advancements, and so on and so forth. So we got to always be cognizant of sub balancing supply with demand. Otherwise, we run out and run into problems. Now, this is another favorite slide of mine, because as we are instrumenting the roadway, we are also knowing more. That is, the tra knowledge about traffic is, grow is increasing. We get a better understanding. And we have started from informing to guiding. Uh, so that means uh, you know, actionable information, uh, I mean, situational awareness is good, which is informing what is happening, but what to do next. A lot of times we are stuck on the roadway for hours if there is a major incident or uh, some other event that takes place to move traffic in the normal sense. And then we are knowing, we are, we are getting so much data, as I said, uh, and we got to use it more effectively into predictive. And I'm glad to say that there are many now niche firms that also are doing prescriptive, especially in the area of uh, asset management, uh, because they collect so much of condition data and they have their own uh, uh, ways of uh, kind of identifying what should be done. So that's prescriptive. Traffic, it's a little more challenging. And I think we are getting there with AI and big data kind of uh, uh, tools that we have. So. Uh, some of the tools that I have tried in my past uh, at least uh, 10, 12 years when I was with VDOT were these kind of applications because in VDOT I was with uh, uh, operations and uh, uh, you know traffic management which is on the supply side, whereas in FDOT I was on the planning side doing travel demand models, that's the demand side. 
So uh, I think uh, that was an advantage for me to, that I've worked in both sides. We use some very good techniques in, uh, in the active traffic management. Speed harmonization is a technique that was very successful, most of Europe, Australia, and such. And so we brought that into Virginia uh, to increase our maximized throughput on the most congested network corridors. You'll see one of them. ICM, I'm not going to tell much about it because it's going to be a more detailed case study. Uh, the, the, the goal is to fill every seat in every mode that's moving on the corridor. And so your modal capacities, how do we incentivize uh, shifts and shares? And dynamic mobility application, this was uh, a thing of the past because we were struggling to get even apps. Now I got 100 apps to guide me and know more information. So that was a struggle at that time. But now we can use the dynamic mobility applications in managing the entire network in real time, not just one corridor. So that's the scaling effect that I was talking earlier. So data management, uh, um, I dealt with a lot of data uh, the US, I mean, 20, 2009 pre presidential inauguration was a, a game changer for us in VDOT. We had unbelievable number of people expected to come for the presidential inauguration, about 1.5 million, it's almost than double. And we were all getting anxious and excited. But after the event, I said, what is wrong that we are not able to use our data properly? So I coined what you call as an idea concept. It's called integrated data exchange architecture. We had so many databases, this separate, we are not, it's not connected. We can't access it quickly. And hence, we just couldn't uh, take advantage of it. But this is more on the institutional side, not on the data science side. So this is the system data that any state DOT has in its databases. And Florida DOT, when I did that idea concept applied to Florida DOT, it was like 3,500 different databases. They're all independently operated. Some are even spreadsheet databases. You can't access them that easily. So, so we kind of created some idea elements, as we call it, for data acquisition, because they started buying third-party data, as you know it, and data integration, that's where it is, and data processing. And there's the real time, there is the uh, static level data and feed into modeling and simulation. That was the goal at that time we prescribed and data sharing. That was the immediate need. Everybody has to have access to data very quickly. Uh, so we did a capture of a, just an example of how we can do transportation project development. What are the databases that are needed for a project? So if you want to get all those databases, this is how it is. This is just a kind of a, a miniature view of the many databases. This is from VDOT, where we work with, uh, you know, using different types of device data and other data sets that come into play for project development. Then when we said, no, that's not the way, this is the way. So we had to have a centralized integrated data hub so that all the data can be connected to them very effectively and efficiently. And if a person wants to develop a project concept or idea, he has to do some analysis first, right? And then goes into design and other application areas, solution development. So uh, th this is how we were envisioning uh, the way we should be conducting uh, data management activities. So we kind of develop some applications, the same concept. I just kind of put that in a big box. But for project development, deployment, asset management, uh, analysis and strategy formulation, because we have needs are continuously growing and it's not a one-time solution process, it's continuous improvement for program efficiencies and management. Now, uh, this is an F dot example where I try to get people and say, look, if you want to do some, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's for a particular analysis. So this is what, your data formats and fields are, and those are the data elements, and those are the sources. So you have hundreds of sources to get to a project description or perform an analysis, and how do we do that? So we came out with a, a, a solution called ROADS. You know, it's called, actually, in the IT world, it's called Enterprise Information Management, but we call it ROADS because we are all 
road centric, right, and uh, state DOT. So reliable, organized, accurate data share. That's what road stands for. I like acronyms. So by now you would have known it. Idea was my acronym. This I challenged uh, the consultant to do this. Hey, I can get one idea. You can get another. So, so this is all about the overall data management in one shot. There's a lot of architectures and other diagrams. I'm not showing that. But one thing that I stressed on while we were developing this was data quality. If data is bad, everything else you do will be not right. So that's the bottom line of data. You can have today's digital data, whatever it is. So this is just data analytics. So we we. We have, I just took this example because it's interesting, right? You have craft beer, import, overall domestic beer and all that. So much of beer, so much of value, if you can see it. Uh, let me see if I'm doing that. So there, it's all in billions, I'm just showing it. So this just didn't happen overnight. There's a lot of stuff that has happened behind and transportation is a big share to get the product to the retail outlets or consumers themselves. So there's a lot of um, supply chain and those kinds of stuff that happen. Here's another example. This is truck as a service market. See trucks, the trucking industry is going through a lot of change. There's shortage of truck drivers. We are trying to do some AV stuff in trucks. So that way we can kind of combat the shorting. But there are also a lot of people who have trucks. They own their own trucks but they have to be pulled up to get to provide those services to the industry that needs. This is almost like uh, uh, almost like worldwide, maybe. So this is uh, just another example. And let's get creative here. Uh, a day analytics on walking. Maybe you got to take a walk if you want to be creative. That's what it says here, see? Five to 10 minutes, it improves your creative thinking. So. I was telling Dr. Ferris, who is here, we'll refer to him later, that he does a lot of leadership coaching for DOTs. So I told him maybe you should take some ideas from here to take the DOT guys who are so busy uh, to improve their creative thinking at the decision-making level, not even at the... But all this is data. Where do you get this? People are working on data coming from different sources, apps, you name it. So here is a, an example. I shared it with Dr. Shaw earlier, and we built our research ideas on that, on this example, actually. Uh, this is a currently going on uh, NCHRP project. It's all about decision making. So this is for leadership uh, as project managers, program managers, and agency level managers like this, the leadership team, because that's where sometimes we hear the bottlenecks are. We got to accelerate that. So how do we do that? We got to show them what are the effects of data so we built three some couple of pilots here and we kind of distributed it according to current topics uh, uh you know exploring the unknowns there is a discovery phase in every aspect uh, we think we know everything but we'll show we'll see that some of the things there are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns and that's where uh, you know all the today's data science tools come to know that unknowns anticipated benefits and that was the thing. But let me get quickly into this pilot studies. We developed about six project ideas and the panel of seven DOTs, including FDOT, they picked three. So they picked the one that is high demand areas of interest, which is nothing but congestion mitigation, downtown, special events, you name it, any other major catastrophes. How do we address that and how do we come up with new solutions using today's data? Uh, the next one is mobility as a service because now equity and other areas are becoming emphasis areas and it's good to manage demand if you can spread uh, across all modes and how do we make those modes attractive? That's the other one. And last, of course, you know, everybody's going after uh, connected autonomous vehicles, implementations. There are so many projects that are being done in every state, but how do we know we are going into the right uh, location to invest those monies and then we have to le learn lessons lessons learned from those and see how future strategies can be in I mean developed so that the investments can yield better return on investments 
so there's an emphasis on uh, what you call performance measures of how the system is performing. So uh, these were the things that the three pilots address, equity, sustainability, resilience, reliability, and of course, connected autonomous. Uh, I'm not, I cannot give the release the results yet because it's being finalized. It's not according to the National Academy of Sciences guidelines, so I can't violate that. But I can tell you this much, I can share a few of the generic uh, content here. This, we created a unified data set from every source of data. You can see, you, you got all the lists, including RFIDs, if you want to truck movements, if there are, I mean, and then whatever technology is producing data, it's almost there, including connected autonomous data from Vijo and Autonomo. They are the data companies that provide that. And so uh, we wanted to not only take it from situational awareness to generating alternate response plans, and then how the plans have worked. Have they worked well according to your expectations? Just like you're being evaluated by your professors, right? How you're performing, the same thing. Uh, so solution is not an end by itself. How the solution is delivered is what is uh, what was uh, did it have the desired effect? So we have put in a lot of stuff. Uh, a, a, I cannot name the company either uh, because I'll be advancing their business. But this is an AI big data platform with machine learning and deep learning algorithms in it. It can. We didn't have the time to make it learn too much because we had a short window of time, but. Uh, it, it was a very good experience for me because I could see uh, the, the impacts of new data science tools of today and how they themselves learn as we uh, kind of use them more and more. Now, the institutional readiness, everything can be good about technology. You may even have good data analytics done. How do institutes use them to advance and accelerate uh, those implementation strategies that they're developing. So uh, in FDOT, when I was there, we tried to do um, accelerate by linking planning and operations. So, you know, it goes in a very sequential area. We go to from planning and analysis to preliminary design and then design and, and all the, you know, the sequence till the project comes to approval and funded, and after that, it takes a longer time. So they did a study 14 years from concept to completion. That's a lot of time. 14 years, a lot of things are changing. In today's world, our cycle time for technology life cycle is so fast that you can't even keep up, right? So we said, no, no, we got to cut down uh, those timings. So we started bringing in, we took it uh, ITS and operational elements as uh, uh, you know, they used to always think about ITS later down the road, but we wanted it to be thought at the conceptualization place, pace, and also we can achieve economies of scale instead of retrofitting. We tend to plan and put those ideas, operational improvements, ITS technologies early on, so that way they get packed into the budget and uh, funding processes. Now, the other one, of course, is an integrated system management uh, one of the goals FDOT has is to have intermodal connectivity. And so they were trying their best to see how that can be accelerated. Collaboration and engagement is a very important thing, uh, but I, I don't want to go much into this because I think I'll be leaving the presentation behind. Right, Professor, you can have it. So that way, you, and if there are any questions, you can kind of get back to me. Linking demand with supply, and we got to close the gap. That's where it is. Other, and we are to also perform risk analysis. What if we don't do this? Then what happens? What is the impact on the system? What is the impact on the user? Whatever that is. Going beyond, that's why we said we had to go beyond projects and programs. And so we had to do that cross-functional integration. Data becomes a very important integral part. And so I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, infrastructure capital and human capital as well. So we got to have knowledge management practices. We have a lot of brilliant people. We are talking about Professor Dr. Ferris, who has actually advanced and mainstream innovation in the agency. 
but then there are pockets of brilliance. But then if you want to bring that culture of thinking beyond what you do every day, thinking something new, you got to develop that culture. And you got to also know the potential of new and younger uh, talent that's coming into the workforce because they come with new tools and uh, like from the, pro from the universities, right? So we got to capture, we got to have a more organized approach. So we developed a framework, uh, try to see how we can have that multi-level coordination within the agency. So from program management to uh, um, up to the highest level of decision making, data is an, a, an essential part, but these are the, some of the elements. And this is also at the geographical level. You can have a segment where there is a project, you can have the whole corridor, uh, regional and statewide. And I tell you, when we were doing this exercise, we could only come up with corridor level uh, kind of approaches for data analysis. But now there's no limits. You can do statewide network analysis to find out bottlenecks to where, where problem areas are, where solutions can be developed. That's the power of the new data platforms. I can't talk enough of that. But then collaboration, data visualization, evaluation, and investigative technology. So because see, we are investigating how the technology is working. So we got to always capture what went well and what didn't go well. And if you don't do that, then we are trying to just go on a, a kind of a, a deployment activity that may result in success, may not. But we want to handle the future in such a way that uh, the customer expectations are met and the infrastructure is also managed well. Now, this is where uh, I would like to talk a little about Dr. Greg Perez. He's a organizational development, change management, and leadership coaching. He does all the three. He has been coaching uh, FDOT's leadership for I don't know how many decades, especially the Turnpike. And uh, he and I joined forces because you know, from the operations world, we have certain tools that can be combined to mainstream innovation within FDOT. We had a couple of conversations with the secretary. Of course, secretary may be leaving, but DOT will still be there and we can still do some work. So, but he was a champion, of course, and we're trying to uh, create a framework for innovation management. It's not just uh, some good projects. You got to pro mainstream innovation into your business, your technical re-engineering and retooling. That's what I was talking about earlier. So that's what it is. And this is just a clip from that. Uh, what we're trying to do, uh, we use the capability maturity model approach. That itself is another topic for discussion. So uh, we can move on. So here is, uh, I don't know how much time I have left. Yeah. So this is one of the case studies that I felt in my 35 years, the most challenging one. It's not just because of adopting new technologies or developing new solutions. It's also about agencies, how they work together, how they can collaborate. So this is uh, part of the new technology initiatives uh, uh, that the DOT has started, and I was leading that at that time. Uh, this is in VDOT. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> This is the, the corridor is all siloed. You have arterials, your freeways, rail systems, bus, everything fragmented. We wanted to see that. Uh, and how do we kind of have those integrated integration opportunities? So the ICM is a concept that US DOT advanced and it's still not fully taken shape. I don't know how many ICM projects are there within Florida yet. Uh, I don't see too many. But it's a challenging one, though, because you've got to have multi-agency collaboration and coordination. Uh, and the purpose of the VDOT ICM initiative is to have enhanced connectivity between modes, use innovative technologies, and uh, advance real-time information, and use every available capacity to move uh, people and enhance safety because we have warning and other things. So this is a study area. I don't want to go much into that, but this is the most congested rank number one according to TTI. Even today, if you want to enjoy congestion, go there and have a ride. You will know what the pain of congestion is. So that's where it is. And uh, it's got 
hundreds and thousands of vehicles and people traveling. And this is the state of play. There's so many modes operating. But this is what I was talking about. Participating agencies. There's every level of agency from city to Department of Defense, because we were going around Pentagon, so they got to be involved in that. So we, because uh, we touched some sensitive areas. So everything. And then, so what? how do we manage this? We get the input from them and uh, also develop some analysis and solutions. This is what we did, stakeholder engagement and project development. So everybody, all the stakeholders who are involved will participate in many of the areas, especially the stakeholder needs. Uh, that's the, that, this is a very important. Uh, and then based on that, we get into different phases, assessment, project needs, deployment recommendations, that's all technology related, and then concept of operations and project planning. So that's, uh, that was the, the major bottleneck for us as an agency to bring all these players and get a unified consensus-based approach. So, and this is just, uh, you know, we don't have hot spots in, in that corridor. There are hot segments. They are like 20 miles of congestion. That's all. See, you see that? That's a 20-mile congestion. And the peaks are different uh, during different uh, directions of travel. So, but then, you know, we always have challenges, and challenges are good to be faced, so we can, they can, we can do other, we can try to expo explore and innovate in a better way. Uh, so we collected all the needs and different uh, aspects of a corridor management and uh, came up with these. And, uh, and then we said, let's focus on end-to-end -end trip making. This was done in 20, 2011 to 12. This was just exactly 10 years ago. And we didn't have all the luxuries of today's tools and analysis capabilities, but we still try to do what we have had at that time. So stakeholder driven. So there are three areas, right? We have the highways, we have the transit, and then we have what we call as TDM, transportation demand management strategies. That means you incentivize if you want to, you know, flex hours. Now it's all remote working, but those days even to implement flex hours was a challenge. So how to spread the demand? It's called peak spreading. So those kinds of stuff. And then, of course, the technology is a, the major driver here. And as I always said, balancing demand with supply is the key. That's what I learned from this uh, total exercise. Uh, and then developed a very uh, a, a nice uh, approach and vision for the corridor. And uh, you know, this is the this is the one that actually when the rubber hits the road. So we have deployment complexities based on the problems and the solutions that were developed as per the strategies here. And uh, so that was it. So these were the things that we wanted to do at that time. There was hardly many, no, not many apps, but we still wanted to try using the cell phone, the website, and then give comparative travel times between highways and rail. There was a rail corridor as well, and the parking availability by time of day. So that's all the wayfinding or what you call road guidance. And these are all the technologies that were being used and we had to connect them, integrate them. Uh, we had, at that time, 511 was the main gateway, but we wanted to develop a standalone. And so we said, we got to have a capture at the, on the website to start with of all the things and if you put in your point A to B as a trip planner, uh, then uh, you should be able to get uh, the, the travel times. Uh, this is the context diagram of system architecture. Uh, and then uh, uh, this is something that uh, we, we tried to do as much as we could, considering the tools and technologies of that day, not ITS technologies, those were available. We're talking about this part, especially the decision support systems. Uh, these were, uh, I mean, we couldn't really do much. So we actually kind of had a very limited, uh, you know, uh, approach on that. But today, sky is the limit. You have all the tools and technologies to develop an efficient uh, uh, demand, uh, I mean, uh, uh, decision support. And then performance management, uh, that was what we did in the NCHRP project. Uh, and I couldn't show that, unfortunately. And then 
we have we had to share the information so we took it in stages uh, phase three is what that is so integrating arterials with freeway management was the main focus and also we used existing traffic data transit data and such so we tried to uh, move away the paradigm shift of moving vehicles to moving people and then end-to-end -end connectivity and intermodal ITS. That means how do we connect and the transfer facilities, those linkages. Uh, then mobility was a word we used many uh, decades ago. And so uh, we, uh, we certainly want people to have a seamless way of traveling. And uh, of course, I have to tell you this, that we focused because the congestion, the causative factor of congestion management was uh, uh, was uh, commuter traffic. Do you know people when they start going to work in the DC metro area, that is Virginia, uh, it's called DMV. So that is DC, Maryland and Virginia. They start leaving their houses at 3 a.m. Yeah, they, they, they do that because they have to be before the peak or you go after the peak. During the peak, you're a mess as a commuter. Others people can afford, but you can't go late to work. So that's what the people wanted. So uh, there are some things that I just wanted to throw at you. Maybe we can talk uh, later on in some smaller groups, um, if time, not today, but some other time. Modeling. So we came across a lot of limitations in the four-step models that we had to use. It was, our modeler was super efficient, so he could get us OD pairs. At that time, we didn't have cellular data to get the OD pairs. See, that's what I'm comparing from then to now. So that's why, and we didn't have any uh, abilities to do predictive or prescriptive modeling or analysis because we didn't have that much of data and that much of tool capability, but now we could. And that's the difference between now and then. New data, you name it, it's all there. Tools are there. I don't know what's coming next uh, beyond blockchain. And so there's so much happening today that we got to keep up. Um, applications, of course, uh, regional mobility strategies, uh, active transportation plans. Most of the MPOs, TPOs, counties want that now. And active demand management. It's everything is active now. We got to get real active with the data that we have. That's what I tell DOTs before we even go to the solution development. Uh, and then, of course, uh, decision models. So I don't know how much decision models are being used. Uh, of course, I don't want to tell something about my PhD work, but I used multi-criteria decision models and uh, multi-objective decision models because I was dealing with land use transportation. Land use is a very tough subject. I mean, there's so many players in that we don't have control over them. But how do we bring in those things into play? And performance management. Today's data tools allow you to dive deep dive into new performance measures and uh, gain new understanding through new insights to develop those performance metrics and return on investment. That's what decision makers want. If I, if I give you a million dollars, how is it going to solve the problem? You can't just tell it descriptively. You have to tell it through measures and return on investments. So as I told you earlier, there's some known unknowns and unknown unknowns. So you can read through the list. I might have touched on some of these already, but I just wanted to capture them uh, in a way that uh, it can be assimilated. But I want to show the next slide. Now, this is food for thought. So we are in, if it is zero to one, you're creating something new. But from nothing to something. That's real innovation. That's what it is. And, uh, you know, it's singular, it's unique, and it's fresh, and it's also refreshing. When the iPhone came, right, everybody was going gaga, right? So that's what it is. So we, we got to look at the zero to one option. I'm coming to the next one later, but the breakthroughs and new pathways are needed. And you see what happened, right? You saw the operating systems that Microsoft built, the, the Google search engines, uh, the Facebooks and other social networks, and then online transactions, PayPal, and those others. SpaceX, well, it's right here in Tala, I'm in Florida. We, we see the effects of that. So, uh, you know, how 
huge Falcon rockets, booster rockets can be reused. That's a total breakthrough. It was never heard of before. And it can save millions of dollars in space expeditions. And then the one other one is Blue Origin. It's vertical takeoff and vertical landing. Oh God, if that can ha come, what happens to runways? Let's think about that later. So that's those are all some breakthroughs, but they're doing it in the space side right now. We don't know how it will come to the commercial side. One to end. So this is what I was telling Dr. Ferris. A lot of people think we are always innovating. No. One to end is doing what you already know how to do. Maybe you can improve it incrementally, make enhancements. Uh, that's what is known unknowns. That is what I call as known unknowns. But this is the real challenge. And I want to leave it today with you all that one to n is what is uh, what is needed now, but zero to one is needed for the future. That's how we can future proof what's coming our way. And a zero to one is making things better. I'm uh, sorry, one to n. Zero to one is changing the game. That's what we listed the previous achievements by those uh, you know pioneers or whatever. And then it's all incremental, but we want to leapfrog from zero to one, and then. Best practices, of course, we do a lot of that stuff, but they phase out, they plateau. At some point, you can't get the return on investment beyond a saturation. They always have endpoints and saturation capacities, as we call it. Zero to one is the one that opens up new vistas. So I would uh, certainly challenge the young minds and uh, the young professionals here who are, uh, you know, uh, out. I um, mean, you're, you're going to graduate one day and finish your PhDs, but if you can start thinking about how to create a breakthrough, you could be the next Elon Musk or Bill Gates or whoever that is. I mean, nothing is impossible. Today, I think we are more empowered than uh, even 10 years ago with so much of capability. How do we use that is what it is, either with technology or data. And so I would certainly, you have a, a, a highly educated, inspiring uh, you know, faculty, and you are trying to also learn new things using new data tools and new data sets. So it's a great opportunity to have that uh, kind of a, a dream. We got to think, think big, bold, be bold, as they say, right? In the yeah, Florida DOT's uh, one liner was great. Uh, is it uh, think big, uh, make a, a be bold, be inspiring, and be innovative? I should have put that there. So that's what it is. Be bold, be inspiring. So you have an inspiration faculty, and you got to be bold in trying to say, don't limit yourself because, oh, it's too big. No, think big. That's what we were talking about on our way here. So I thank Dr. Shaw for giving me this opportunity. And certainly, if there are any questions I would like to take, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Th thank you, Chris. It's uh, so insightful and in inspiring presentation. And uh, uh, I think uh, you may know that we have both in-class session and the online session. I checked online session. There are 20 to 30 people. So your session is very well attended, including the uh, uh, on-site attendance. So if you have any questions uh, for the in-class room, Folks, you can raise your hands, and I'll monitor the uh, chat box or and, and the uh, teams as well. So let's see. Uh, I I've seen. That. Is there a hand from the in classroom? Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, there is already some good comments. Yeah. You see along the way. Uh, right. Great to see TDM is part of ICM. That's awesome. And we'll watch the Falcon launch next Thursday. Well, just to tune, tune, stay tuned for that. Um, sure. While you're at, uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, I think for those uh, online, you can either unmute yourself or type your questions in the chat box. So while we're composing the questions, I think I can start with. Uh, someone to 
uh, warm up the, the your, your thoughts, hopefully. Um, I, I really like your presentation, particularly you, you sort you know, it, it's, uh, it, in, it integrates, it looked back at what we've done, and but also it looked forward into what we should do. And also it talks about issues about the innovation management. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's actually, this is that, the first time I heard, it, you know, we could think think that as an office and sort of like a engineering innovation, make that into a sort of system approach. So um, I, I think this is questions for both Greg and Chris. How, how, you know, besides what we're doing here, what, uh, why, um, you know, why do you see a need for sort of like make this institutional? There is office and. Uh, and maybe some uh, protocols to, to get the innovations going. Yeah. I'll take the technical part and Greg will take the OD organization side. So if you go to DOT today, now of course it's all digital PDF, uh, and there are thousands of research reports that are actually funded by DOT and executed and delivered by the uh, by the state universities and centers like Qatar. I'm not too sure, I was F dot, I can tell a little more boldly, uh, that I wasn't sure how much of that is getting implemented, how much is used, and if it is used, what are the lessons learned? We don't have that. First of all, a lot of people don't even know that there's so much of a library of knowledge and those uh, you know, research studies and reports that are done. So what I recommended uh, uh, was a few, two years ago, you know, now we have natural language processing. So if you put keywords, of course, you've got to have the platform for that. If you put keywords, it will pull all that, every sentence in that report, congestion or safety or fatality, it will pull every, it will tell you all the topical areas, but you've got to train it. It's an algorithm. It's a machine learning process. So where I learned this is, uh, I was in a company, private sector in uh, DC, and uh, uh, that company is a data science company. And I was, uh, we were one of the few odd guys, transportation, walking around. So one lady said, hey, Chris, the DOJ has so much of, uh, uh, you know, reports. They're even hard paper. And how do we access these so many files to get the right information to the lawyers. This is totally different. It's not even transportation. Then I said, we have an expert in natural language processing and we'll take it to them. And he said, we can read, if you train it fully, it can read 60,000 pages per second. I don't know how it does, but it does. So it can cut down so much of time in reading and capturing and assimilating the information. It's unbelievable. I don't know whether they tried it. We, we just recommended that. But that's uh, what we have, we got to know first, including data and the reports. But on the organizational side, I'll leave it to Dr. Perez. Thank you. That's where innovation can come. Yeah. This is a new term, innovation management. But you all know what ROI means, don't you? What's it mean? Oh, return on inv innovation, is that what you said? <laughs> sure it is. But that's what we're finding out in most organizations now. They say, well, let's be innovative. Well, that's fine, what are you gonna do? Well, I want you to sign in a note here that says, you promise to go back to your district and be innovative. Well, that lasts about two weeks. Everybody went back to the way it was. You know, comfort zones means I'm comfortable, but nothing big ever comes out of a comfort zone, right? So we thought what really needs to be done is managing innovation, not to structure it, but to put it to use till we know what's going on and people making commitment, especially with leaders. And it requires one heck of a transformation, a paradigm shift. Innovation management means that you get people involved. So what we're saying is before you get really, think about innovation, get your organization in readiness for innovation. Get everybody on board. Relentless communication. So that's kind of what innovation management is, but it really is changing behaviors. I guess what I do is make people think it's their own idea. So anyway, perhaps in the future we'll have a chance to talk more about that. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, one thing is, uh, we are actually in the process of 
process of developing an innovation management framework mm -hmm. at the interest of the secretary. And uh, uh, actually, we are going to talk to him to leave, be the person whom we should uh, contact after he leaves, because he's likely to go to Orlando, as you all know it, by the end of March. So we're going to have another meeting with him. But we are trying to develop some framework, a framework using capability maturity model, which will involve people input. That means the employees at all levels, mm -hmm. because there are different levels at which they know different information. Now, that has to be consolidated to get to that. What is the desired state? You, de you define your desired state where you want to be 10 years hence or 20 years hence. And then we will guide you through the process of building a roadmap using the capability maturity model. So that's our goal. Yeah, what a fabulous goal. And that's great. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that uh, sort of uh, inspired me to think of uh, some performance measures of innovation, right? It can kick that into the, the, the evaluations of individuals, workers, employees, right? So I think we should come up with that, that kind of measures to our students <laughs> when they're doing research. Uh, let's see, do we have uh, any other uh, questions? We're uh, okay. So great. Seems like uh, the presentation is very clear, and you guys uh, have uh, got everything uh, well understood. And uh, I think it's about the time. And again, I want to thank uh, Chris and Greg for for the uh, great presentation. Um, and uh, I uh, so. The next week we will have a PhD candidate Yuna Yang to present uh, her uh, dissertation work about uh, safety analysis using both traditional statistics and uh, uh, machine learning tools. Um, so please uh, join us again. And uh, uh, so this uh, adjourns today's meeting and hope you all have a great weekend.